Thank you so much, uh, Remy. If, if we'll have time at the end, we'll open the floor for discussion. But now I'd like to call on Evelyn Fox Keller for her presentation on of what relevance is the history of science to present and future science. First, thank you, Rainey, for a wonderful talk. Like everything else, the history of science has itself a past, a present, and a future. Today, <coughs> we've been asked to think about its future, but again, like everywhere else, in thinking about the future of the subject, it is useful to look back on its past. Can you hear me? Okay. The beginning of the subject is a distinctive field of study, at least in the U.S., is often associated with George Sarton and his launching of the journal ISIS in 1913. Eleven years later, Sarton helped found the History of Science Society. The history of science was now a professional discipline with a journal and a society of its own. But who were the early members of the society? Who were the readers of the journal? Indeed, who were the authors of its articles? What and whom was the history of science for? The answer at that time, interest in this subject, was to be found primarily among working scientists. They were both the journal's main readers and its main authors. As Peter Deere has noted, for most scientists at that time, the past of their disciplines was an integral part of the science itself. That is clearly no longer the case today. Over the course of the past century, a huge gap between the interests of working scientists and historians of science has grown ever larger, to the point that prompts me to ask, what, if any, relevance does the history of science have to scientists working today? The reasons for this widening gap are several, and they are all of a consequence of the changes occurring in both sets of disciplines. Both sets of disciplines have experienced, or the, and the, or the changes that the both have experienced over this period. Let me just main, mention a few of these reasons. First, what historians of science take to be the subject of their enterprise has undergone dramatic transformation. The most conspicuous such transformation is surely to be found in the rejection of historical accounts in which the past history of a subject is seen as leading to, even culminating in, present beliefs. In the case of science, as a progressive replacement of false beliefs of the past by truth theories of the present. In short, in the rejection of Whig history and in its, and in its place, uh, a commitment to the task of understanding the past, not in our own terms, but in the, in the terms of the past itself. Thomas Kuhn, whose book, The Structure of Re Scientific Revolutions, broke all-time sales records in the field, was one of the most important influences in this shift. For Kuhn, as for a number of other of his contemporaries, for example, Ludwig Fleck, Norwood Hansen, the view of science as a steady progression to an ever truer, more complete representation of the natural world required radical recasting. The view of the history of science as leading us to our present understanding of the world was like the view of evolution seen as leading to man. Both, or so Kuhn argued, are profoundly mistaken. Evolution by natural selection leads not to perfection, but to an endlessly branching tree of life. So too, the growth of science proceeds not by a progressive convergence on truth, but rather by discontinuities and ruptures, buffeted by all sorts of forces that extend well beyond the impetus of logic and evidence, propelling the exploration of branches that go off in ever new directions. In fact, Kuhn frequently drew on the tree of life as a metaphor for the history of science. In his later years, he argued that the mapping of the changes in scientific lexicons might provide a useful representation of the structure of scientific revolutions, with branching points corresponding to ruptures in scientific terminology that signaled shifts in paradigm. Indeed, in his view, 
Truth is as illusory a goal for the growth of scientific knowledge as is perfection for biological evolution. Since Kuhn, biologists and historians both have learned many new lessons, and both the tree of knowledge and the tree of life have morphed into far more like something, things more like densely entangled structures, messy bushes, characterized not only by branching, but also by fusing, by all sorts of other topological contortions. So too, our understanding of the forces driving this proliferation has also greatly expanded, revealing dynamic landscapes that are equally entangled, often in surprising ways. The picture of the history of science coming off the pages of ISIS today is no vindication of present scientific beliefs. Indeed, it often seems to have little to do with actual con the actual content of the c contemporary scientific knowledge. Certainly, it is less flattering to the egos of workers in the field than were the histories that had earlier been written, often by scientists themselves. And in any case, it is generally far more likely to evoke puzzlement than interest. What, after all, does all this have to do with them and with what they do? In the meantime, enormous changes have also taken place in the practices of the sciences themselves, perhaps especially in the practices of scientific writing. In the early part of the century, the scientific literature was full of long contemplative essays, replete with historical reference. Today, scientific articles are short, getting shorter all the time, with citations rarely older than a decade, and often not even that. The pace of scientific re research has escalated phenomenally, and if one is to keep up, much that had previously been part of the literature of the past must be scuttled. Not only historical reference, but also spe speculation, conceptual integration, even explanation are often out the door. In some fields, it is becoming increasingly difficult even for the scientifically literate reader to make her way amidst the jargon, undefined acronyms, and technical shortcuts of contemporary research. To see how the practices of scientific writing are changing, just take a look at some current issues of nature and compare them with issues of the same journal even of a decade or two ago. Perhaps inevitably, the net effect of such changes in writing practices is an ever-widening gap in readership between the two cultures. Again, the two cultures. My guess is that most historians today are not much bothered by this. Many would say that there's nothing to dictate that the history of science needs to have relevance to present or future scientific practice. But in my view, this gap speaks to the loss of an important opportunity. Along with Hasak Chang and others, I argue that history provides us with tools for thinking critically about received ideas. It provides evidence of roads that not only had not been taken, but often that could no longer be envisioned, cast into oblivion by linguistic traditions that effectively erase all traces of such alternative pathways. Indeed, I would go so far as to suggest that at certain critical moments in scientific history, an activist role for at least some historians and philosophers of science, particularly for historians of recent science, is both possible and of potentially significant value to working scientists. The language of scientific practice has been of particular interest, particular interest to me in my own work on the history of contemporary genetics and developmental biology. I share Kuhn's interest in scientific lexicons, but have been struck by the limits of, the, of applicability of his image of branching tree-like structures. Certainly, it is true that scientific terms are constantly being redefined. But while Kuhn emphasized the importance of shifts from one definition to another, I am struck by the extent to which, in the fields I have studied at least, new definitions need not replace older definitions, but can simply be added alongside older definitions, thus giving rise, to, giving rise to lexicons with constant traffic between the old and the new, and a cons consequent occlusion of phenomena hidden in the differences between older and newer or definitions. The net effect is that of a kind of hysteresis, a drag on a subject's capacity for change. Genetics does not undergo revolutions, in Kuhn's sense of the term, but rather much more muted sorts of change. 
change that can in the same breath be both celebrated or denied. Such linguistic practices give rise to a no man's land, a phenomena that fall between definitions, that fade in and out of attention, one minute visible, another not. And inevitably, it slows down investigation of these phenomena that are only liminally apparent. To illustrate at least one way in which attention to issues of this sort can, in principle, provide a resource for geneticists and developmental biologists working today, let me very briefly sketch an example of this dynamic. A brief glance at the terminological history of genetics reveals that the key terms, all the key terms, gene, genome, genetics, mutation, or in the molecular age, genetic code, instructions, blueprint, all have the feature of carrying multiple meanings. Faithfully transmitted, all, all the meanings faithfully transmitted from generation to generation through textbooks and dictionaries. Early classical meanings are not abandoned, but rather they are supplemented, added onto, with the obvious effect, effect of encouraging free and easy slippage from one meaning to another. Moreover, there is a pattern to this multiplicity of meaning. First, in virtually all cases, that multiplicity is actually reduces to a duality, a duality with a common theme. Secondly, between the two primary meanings lies a common and now tacit difference, a difference that itself has a reference. The difference refers to the real, albeit overlooked, domain that has been included by the slippage between the two meanings. Thus, for example, the simultaneous definition of genetics as a study of genes, on the one hand, and as the study of inheritance, on the other, invites the implication that genes are the only vehicle of heredity. Definition of the genome, both as the full complement of genes and as the full complement of DNA, invites the assumption that DNA carries nothing but genes. The definition of mutation, alternatively, as a heritable genetic change or as a change in the DNA sequence, implies both that all heritable changes must be changes in DNA sequence, and relatedly, that they necessarily correspond to changes in genes. What is forgotten in this frame, this frame that is constructed by polysemy, by a, pat a pattern of principled polysemy, polysemy I may find my way in the place in the text, are the many epigenetic changes that, even when not passed on to the next generation, are faithfully transmitted through the lifetime of the organism and are in themselves the triggers for many diseases, for example. Of course, the term gene is itself notorious for its lack of a clear, agreed-upon definition, but there is a default definition that today's biologists routinely fall back upon. Namely, a gene is the DNA sequence coding for a protein. But it turns out, after the Genome Project, as we have learned, that only 1% of the DNA codes for proteins. What about the remaining 99% of the DNA? Historically unnamed, lost in the cracks between definitions, it was argued for a long time that this very real physical structure, 99% of the DNA molecule, uh, <clears throat> might simply be regarded as junk. And so it was referred to as junk, that's the junk DNA. I could go on, but I hope these examples suffice to make my point. Past assumptions, though now explicitly rejected, are often sustained by the lexicon of the discipline, silently inhibiting the pursuit of phenomena that explicit changes in belief bring into view. I must confess to you, however, that my views on this issue are not widely shared. Certainly, they're not shared by many working scientists, nor for that matter, by many practicing historians, and in any case, are scarcely relevant to most of the latter. But still, I can hope for a place in the history of science of work that it can have relevance to today's scientists. Especially, I can hope that the two disciplines will not continue to diverge as they have over the past century. In fact, I can hope that they will find an, somehow find a way back into dialogue. Thank you.